this, uh, this will be the last class for this quarter. <clears throat> and then next quarter we'll go into it. Um, law and lamb contrast. <clears throat> so I want to make a little bridge here between this quarter and next quarter. Um, and to do that, I'd like for you to turn with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter um, 2. I guess we can go to 1 first. We'll just read verse 1 and verse 26. I'm sorry, Genesis 1, verse 26. <clears throat> and God said, let us make man in our own image. He didn't just say, hey, let's make a man. Let's come up with a concept of another kind of creature, and we'll call it man. He made all of this stuff, and then he said, let's make something that has our image, that's after our likeness. And he, and he called it man. Now, everything after the fall is not that. It, it does not fulfill whatever was in his heart when he said this. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let, well, we don't need to read the rest of that, because I'm really shooting for Genesis uh, 2. And remember that what we just read was before the fall. <clears throat> Genesis 2, and starting with verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in, that day, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him an help fit for him. <clears throat> All right. I don't know if we've ever noticed the flow of this, but he makes man, in, as it were, in his image. At least that's his goal in his heart. He then puts him in a garden that is, you know, beautiful. And... Um, but then he says, there's, there's a, a tree here I don't want you to eat of. Of every tree, you got the whole thing. It's all yours, just not that one, one tree. Um, all the trees you shall surely eat. Um, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely got, die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. He didn't say it's not good that you, if you do eat of it, that's not going to be good. And he is <clears throat> just saying, look, I'm after something here. My heart and my mind are flowing in this direction. But let me just say, don't eat of that. And then Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, Elohim says, immediately upon don't eat of that, it's not good for him to be alone. Let us make a counterpart. Let us make one fit. Let us make, you understand? Let us make something that will bring us pleasure. Let us make something that will have our salt nature that seasons everyone else at our own loss and our light nature that gives them seeing. And that's, that's right after he says, don't eat at that truth. 
And then let's go to Genesis uh, 3 now. And so the enemy is there, and the enemy says this in Genesis 3, 5. And he's saying this to them. For God doth know that in the day that ye eat thereof, he's saying, you, you, don't, you, know, you don't have to listen to him. God knows that in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil, knowing contrast. Not oneness, but contrast, separateness, differences, things that divide good and evil. knowing that. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. So, the, the first failure of man in relationship to this was in relationship to knowledge. It was a step away from the image of God and a step towards a knowledge that appeared to be of God. You'll be like God, knowing. We'll have the knowledge of God. We'll have knowledge that God has will have the knowledge of God. Um, so I wrote this. We know we received sin at the fall, but we, didn't, we don't, didn't really realize what we lost. We knew what we gained. We gained sin. But for most, they didn't realize that we just lost the image of God. We're all concerned about sin. Oh, no. We're lost instead of he lost something. And, and this, this preoccupation with ourselves and with others. We lo we're lost. And we need God to save us no thought of we need God to bring us back to himself with his image. But rather save us from, well, I don't even know that it's save us from sin as much as save us from hell and save us from, you know, the things that most Christians today think about. Save us from punishment for sins and, and all that kind of stuff. But rather, you know, just bring me back to a state where I can go to heaven. No, no, no recognition of the loss to God at all. None. None. No recognition. They might even have been aware that they gained something good, what they call good. God said don't eat of it, so it's not good according to God's understanding. You say, but good is mixed in with it, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yeah, but the law and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil doesn't give you the ability to do good and not do evil. It doesn't give you that ability. It mixes the two now. You know, it doesn't fix it. It mixes. And, but, but now this is good because I can see how much better I am than somebody else because I can see what's wrong with them. And I can see how good that I am in contrast. So I wrote, uh, we know we, uh, let's say I wrote, man took within himself the added ability. So this was an added ability to know good and evil. Man took within himself an added ability to see a contrast of good and evil. 
Man's first use of it was to contrast himself with something else that made him look superior to what was around him. God shows up. All right, so where's the, where's the conviction? I mean, obviously they knew something was wrong because they covered themselves as if that was bad. But I mean, without the knowledge of good and evil, it was just the way it was supposed to be. It's the way God made them. How about that? It was the way God made them. And so there was no sense of, you know, me. Do you understand that? There was no, I mean, that's the thing about nakedness. There's, there's no sense of me. There's only the sense of us. But when they, when they gained this knowledge, now they had a sense of themselves. God says, you know, sees the fig leaves and says, what have you done? What have you done? Adam goes, wasn't me, I'm good, she's evil. Not me, her. She goes, wasn't me, is that snake? Knowledge of good and evil, except for somehow we're always the good, aren't we? Somehow everybody else is the problem. Somehow. So that last part of this, well, the statement, man's first use of it, first use of the knowledge of good and evil is a contrast himself with something else that made him look superior to what was around him. That was the first result of this, knowledge of good and evil. Every time you have a contrast with somebody that's a member of the body of Christ, a member that's a believer, it's a con we make a contrast of the, the separateness. We can't see through eyes of oneness as long as we're functioning and still eating of that tree. We, you know, like I've said before, we blame Adam and go, I would never do that, but we do it on a regular basis. We're still eating of that tree. We should know that that's what it is. It's, that's, this is the fruit of that tree. Me trying to contrast and be separate and, you know, look better and whatever. But we, we either we ignore it or we act like we don't know that and that this is the right way. The only right way is they're wrong and I'm right. Right? I mean, isn't that, I mean, isn't that the feel you get from the very first example of the knowledge of good and evil is how in the world could anybody feel right with God? But somehow the, the, the knowledge of good and evil allows you to shift what's good and what's evil and do it in such a manner that you don't just melt, you don't just explode or just melt into a pile of nothing liquid before God because, oh my God, everything was perfect and we blew it and we're idiots. You know, you know, and think about that. I mean, that's standing in the literal presence of God with sin. But the knowledge of good and evil saved him. They didn't even know they lost the image of God. They didn't know what the effect on him is. He looks like he's just asking questions. No big deal. He's all right. He's not hurt. He's not, you know, whatever. He's okay. So because God doesn't, in the Bible, do this so that us and our generation can look, because he doesn't go, I've lost what I love. I've lost the very thing that, that I desired and, and, you know, she would have become everything that would fulfill her, you know. Because he doesn't do that, because he's not self-centered, right? He's not going to react that way in the sense of trying to get to point that to him. We don't see that. We don't see his heart. We don't, we don't see a contrast because of that nature compared to everybody else. We just simply see well, the fall. This is the fall. This is sin. Um, I'm going to 
this read. We felt better about ourselves, but God had lost the image he desired. You know. I really did I I really didn't do it. She did it. <laughs> Wasn't me. It was the serpent. See, we, we say, you know, we get into that situation and we blame the devil. And sure, you know, sure, the enemy was there. But we're the ones who want God's wisdom. We want the knowledge of God. And we think it's okay to put that above the image of God no matter how deep. We think that's okay. In fact, we don't think it's okay. We are not even aware that that's such a contrast. Because that's a contrast not of good and evil, but of good and evil versus life. Amen? The tree of life. See, they never got that contrast. In like manner, the law shows us a contrast of what we should or should not do, right? The law says, do this, don't do that. It's really based on the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Do y'all see that? I mean, it really is. I mean, if you really think about it, just meditate on it for a minute, and you will see that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the law are very similar, and in the law, God gives us a picture of what he says is good and a picture of what he says is evil. Okay, so we set about to be the good. <laughs> we, again, no, no understanding of the lost image that God wanted to form in us and wanted us to be to him the way that he, no knowledge of that, just, oh, uh, I'm gonna use this knowledge of good and evil to better myself. So you pursue trying to do good and do right and, you know, that sort of thing. It may make us try harder, either the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or the law. It may make us try harder, but it, it, you, can't, you can't win that way. Why can you not win that way? Because it's a perverted image. It doesn't matter what you do with it. It's already wrong. It's built in wrong. It is not lamb. It is not that image that God wanted formed in us. It is, it is there is no heart coming out of us toward his heart. There is no embrace. The, 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 the biggest embrace, and the Pharisees proved this, the biggest embrace is the embrace of the law. The law is, the law is holy, the Torah, and they treat it like God more than they treat God like God one who desired us after his kind. Not more than, they don't treat God, I'm not saying, I say they treat the law like God. What I didn't say was that, and they don't treat God like God. That's not the issue. It, to treat God like God is still under the law. It's the perverted image that will always, always like water, always runs to the lowest level. We will always run to the lowest level, and his heart knows the difference, and he knows to the core what's wrong with mankind. And, we, and we're all, you know, you know, we're all unique. I mean, uniquely us. But we all have the same nature. And so we're not unique at all. We all do the same things, maybe at different times in different ways. And especially when it comes, see, maybe we don't get that so much here, but he gets it. That's the same, 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 that's the same. And until Jesus showed up on the earth, everything was the same until he showed up. And he goes, that's different. That's my image. 
There it is. That pleases me. This is my beloved son. This is what I love. This is what is birthed out of me, what you should have been. And now he's going to try to bring you out of religion and into bride, into a relationship with him that doesn't think I should start treating God like God. No, you should start treating God after the manner of his heart that you have discovered by the Holy Spirit. And if you don't do that, then you're just religious. And me. In fact, I've got a little thing here I may read that, and me, no question about it. In the Pharisees' case, they felt that they were righteous according to the law, remember? They thought they were righteous. They, th in other words, they thought they were in better standing with God than anybody else on the planet. And they were, may I say it, an abomination in their nature and in the way that they proceeded. An abomination. They weren't just, you know, you could say, well, um, uh, you do bad things. Or you sin, I'm talking to the Pharisees, you do bad things, you sin. God doesn't go, well, you do bad things and you sin. He goes, that is the complete opposite, the, the most perverted nature of all that lives for itself and has gained my thing that I wanted to get a bride out of and made a religion out of it and may make everyone else twofold the child of hell that you are. Oh yeah, Jesus said that, that's right. Wonder why he said that? Because he knows, because this is not just the fall of man because of sin to him. This is disaster to his heart, not to his plan. Sin would be a disaster to his plan, if you understand what I mean with the way we see the plan of God. But this is disaster to his heart. And nobody will really know that until you are allowed into the holy of holies of his heart and see and you're there with him in heart and then you can discover reality. Until then you're all shut out. We're all shut out. Okay. But the whole the high priest goes in once a year is a picture of Jesus is going to be that high priest, see? And he's the only one allowed in there because he has that image, see? He's, it's not just that he was sinless. I mean, I love even the example of, of, of the, when it talks about he was sinless, like in, in uh, 1 Peter, where he, who, who did no sin. It says, he, you know, that, that uh, he did no sin, uh, meaning that he was sinless. And, and then it starts talking about practical stuff. Who was reviled, he reviled not again. Who, it's all lamb stuff. It's all nature stuff. It's nothing to do with, well, I didn't rape anybody or I didn't rob this or I didn't dig up somebody's grave and steal off of their dead body or, you know, all the things that we would go, oh, this is horrible, this is horrible. This is horrible to him. But since we lost the image of God, the greater contrast is now our image contrasted with Jesus. And that's the purpose of the law. The law is good if it's used lawfully, but it's for people that are messed up, which see, the knowledge of good and evil means, well, that means it's for everybody else. <laughs> it's perfect. We can get out of everything and excuse everything, and we pretty much do. And see, when it comes to this stuff of nature and of, of what is his desire and what one after his kind means, if we don't really have a real reality from his heart, 
finish this theology so we do our best under the law to be that or to act that way. And we, you know, of course it's wrong and he, he just goes, you know, I'm shutting the curtain. <laughs> How long are you gonna be in there? You know, thousands of years, thousands of years until I see something that looks like me. Death on a cross, rip! Lamb of God, look at that. For others, for everyone else, for the worst. And he goes, I'm here. Now I'm ready to talk to somebody. When we see him, we see how far we've fallen. When, when we, you know, I, I, can I say it like this? I think there's kind of levels of the revelation of Christ. Like, for example, Romans 7 is a revelation really of yourself and how wretched you are. It's not so much a revelation of him, but it is. But it's, but it's the law of contrast revelation uh, where you come away with, oh, wretched man that I am. Um, there, can be a, there can be a contrast of our sinful state just being in his presence. But there is a, um, there's a contrast of images that goes deep. That's the only way I know how to put it. It has to be no longer looking at darkness shadows but looking and seeing and i'm going to even put it like this this is you know whatever it's not seeing jesus christ it's seeing lamb on the throne slaughtered lamb on the throne you know how how book of revelation begins first couple of chapters there and it's dealing with the churches well it's all jesus christ jesus christ jesus christ but once you take it up into glory once you take it up in above where things are seen from above, the name Jesus isn't used that much, but the name Lamb is used over 22 times. And that's who we end up marrying in the end, meaning oneness is complete. He gets the one that he was after. So that, then, okay. But we go, okay, I saw, I saw a contrast of me with Jesus. Uh, excuse me <laughs> the dramatic but what an eccentric performance but that is that you know we go through the weirdness of you know and yeah it's it's tough or whatever or wonderful or whatever but it is it doesn't strike as deep as seeing your perverted nature or image which would be to him the worst one that you could put in the Old Testament, the worst image that you could set up. You understand what I mean? It's the worst. The worst image. He, you know, well God hates idolatry. Pfft, he hates you worshiping this perverted image. I mean that's really the heart of it. He's not sitting there going, I don't like wood carved. I don't know, it just bugs me. <laughs> Put a little nose on it and stuff like that. <laughs> I, just, I just can't abide that. <laughs> just, isn't it ridiculous? <laughs> there are issues here, huge issues to this stuff. And yet there has to be breakthroughs. And yet the greatest breakthrough is going to be this contrast of images where we see this this is not, and you know, and I'm talking in all of our height of religiousness. They that sat in darkness, remember how we started the last, they that sat in darkness saw a great light. Oh, yeah. what, who was it that said, what have I to do with images, Habakkuk? Wasn't that him or one of those guys? What have I to do anymore? I've seen him. Hosea, what have I to do with images? What have I, that's, I'm done with that now. 
Glory to God. Glory to God. But, you know, I mean, I remember when I sat in Bible school and I would hear stuff. And when the spirit would affect me, I was so, I didn't want, you know, I didn't want to miss it. And I'd go back to my room and uh, our dorms didn't have air conditioning either, y'all's didn't and stuff. I'd lay there and I'd just sweat and, and the lights out at 10 o'clock. I'm going, what kind of Bible school is this? Lights out at 10 o'clock. I need Jesus. I'm here for Jesus. I need 10, 11, 12, 1, I need, you know. <clears throat> and because of the dorm we had, the walls only went up halfway and they were cubicles and not actual rooms. If you had a light on, everybody knew it and they said, turn your light on. So I'm under my sheet with a flashlight sweating and going, I just want you and I just, I, I, I don't, you know, I know that you're right and I'm wrong without knowing that. Yes. You know what I mean? It was just like that. I'm just like, duh, but still. And he kind of went, that's, that's good. You know, that's good. For starters, that there is that drive. Where, where is that drive? Amen? Where is that drive? That drive that says, you know, we, we love quoting uh, Song of Solomon, uh, draw us, we will run. You know, we're more like the, what, what is it called, the, the dead, the walking dead, you know, the, the Jesus is coming. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's going, you know, I mean, you could, you could, you could walk just a little fast and outrun those guys, you know, and I'm like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's like, are y'all coming or not? Well, I'm dead on the inside. Give me a break. <laughs> you know, draw us and we will walk like zombies. And we will glorify you when the crowd looks at what's following you. <laughs> yeah, you know, our hearts, you know, my heart, it's right here. <laughs> God, you know, and there is a, and there has to be a realness to the scriptures when it says, draw me, I will run. When we feel him drawing, let's run. We see, we, when we see him, we see how far we have fallen, meaning we've lost the image. Do you understand? We don't see how sinful Adam is. I mean, yes, that's early going, but we see what was really in God's heart. This is the contrast I'm talking to, a contrast of images. Um, we see that we do we see that what we do is not the issue. I mean, that's a pretty leap, pretty good leap just to get over the what we do. Yeah. This isn't the issue. This isn't, the, if I did everything perfect, see, we go, well, I messed up, or I didn't show Jesus, or I didn't, you know, I should have helped them, or da da da, da or whatever, you know, and all that's just condemnation for probably an image that is not the true image. And so we should get down to brass tacks. See, the blood is great, but that's only mentioned in the first three chapters of Romans, and then he spends the rest of the time trying to bring us to the cross uh, on different levels. I mean, in, 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 in Romans 5, one aspect of it, or Romans 6, another aspect of it, 
Romans 7, another aspect of it. Romans 8, a completely, a real change starting to happen in Romans 8. A mammoth change that starts happening in Romans, Romans 8 that deals with an image change. To be conformed to the image of Christ. That's the first time it's used in Romans. Romans 8. And then it takes us off. Takes us, takes us right. Hallelujah. We discovered that what is not him and out from him is the thing that falls short because it's not his image. That's only, I mean, that's why. Okay, so if, you know, if, if this person loves me and I love that person uh, and I see that and they want me to conform to their image and I'm not conforming, um, what is the problem? Let me ask you, what is the problem? Is the problem not conforming? Or is the problem, I need that image, I want him? It's a, those are issues of the heart, folks. Those are not issues of religion. Those come down to the things that will reach him. I'm going to just close with reading my, I took this out of some of my other notes. It's called My Foolish Writings. <clears throat> God speaks to me and says, and this is just out of my own notes, God speaks to me and says, you may read and see many deep and wonderful things, but you do not see, see, you do not, and it's in parenthesis, you do not see. Your religious ways make a puppet of you so that Christ cannot be seen and known by heart and nature. He is life and ever will be, but your mind itself is a veil. Your mind itself is a veil. You do not see, nor do you hear, because the veil clouds your eyes and shall not be lifted except by the one who has nail-scarred hands. Then the law veil passes away. Only then does the mist that blinds you melt away at the rising of the sun. Until then, you walk among us, but you walk as unawakened. You are like a person whose spirit is set at naught while his soul goes wandering where it desires. You are tossed upon the sea and driven. You direct the course of your soul according to hours and seasons, wants and interests. You are dwelling within the bounds of moments while eternity is far from your heart. But the truth is not far from you, meaning me or believers. God has hidden life's inmost secret in the depths of your being, waiting for the Spirit to breathe upon you and awaken you to it. When that time comes, the Spirit turns the dead letter of the scriptures into music. You become an instrument through whose being the Spirit sings the song of life. The Spirit becomes to you the whispering of the wind who blows in certain directions as he desires. At the same moment, the Lamb gives you direction from within by life and by nature. The call of God to you is not like that of assigning an occupation for you, but like a dream that is born within your bosom. Let the Spirit wash away that which is written on stone and transform it into the heart of a Lamb King. Open up more, for without the Word living, 
the living word, you are but an echo of what was meant. This middle part, when he said, until then you walk among us, but you walk as unawakened. You are like a spirit, you are like a person whose spirit is set at naught. It's like my spirit is not in tune. While your soul goes wandering where it will. Mm. In fact, I wrote wandering where it desires. You are tossed upon the sea and driven. Where is that? Jude? Book of Jude? You are tossed upon the sea and driven. You direct the course of your soul according to hours and seasons, wants and interests. You are dwelling within the bounds of moments while eternity is far from your heart. May I read the last part again? Is that okay? Yes. But the truth is not far from you. God has hidden life's inmost secret in the depths of your being, waiting for the Spirit to breathe upon you and awaken you to it. When that time comes, the Spirit turns the dead letter of the Scriptures into music. You become an instrument through whose being the Spirit sings the song of life. The Spirit becomes to you the whispering of the wind who blows in certain directions at his desire. At the same moment, the Lamb gives direction from within by life and by nature. The call of God to you is not like that of assigning an occupation for you, but like a dream that is born within your bosom. Let the Spirit wash away that which is written on stone and transform it into the heart of a Lamb King. Open up more, for without the Word living, the living Word, you are but an echo of what was meant. Father, we just ask you to continue to, to Allow the Spirit to descend on Christ and to bring forth more of Him, more of His nature, more of His ways, that our minds, our minds may be washed and done away and we let His mind be in us, the Lamb mind. Father, that it is real and it is moment by moment and it is not as other men walk, but like Enoch who walked with you day by day. And he was so with you that you took him. You took him to yourself. You wanted him. You took him. May we not just die on this planet because we lived a Christian life and feel safe that we're going to go to heaven. But may we walk with you, Jesus, in such a manner that at a certain time, you just take us to yourself. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.